uh, introducing the first speaker of the day, Professor Adam Narasimha, uh, who is uh, the DST Year of Science Professor of uh, at JNCASR in Engineering Mechanics. Uh, his ma main scientific interest is in aerospace and atmospheric fluid dynamics. Uh, but in addition to his scientific preoccupations, Professor Narasimha has had an abiding interest in the history and philosophy of classical Indic science and the role of science uh, in society and government. Um, he has pursued these both in his uh, uh, individual capacity, uh, but also uh, in, during his term as director of the National uh, Aerospace Laboratories and uh, the National Institute of uh, Advanced Studies. Uh, he's a co-editor of uh, uh, an, in, an encyclopedia of classical Indian sciences and of nature and culture. Um, he's a recipient of numerous recognitions for his contributions, which I shall not uh, list, uh, and likewise for the other distinguished speakers and panelists today. Um, and Professor Nasima has uh, served on many important uh, science advisory bodies over the years, and, and uh, therefore uh, he is eminently suited to speak on some of the themes I mentioned uh, that we would like to discuss today. And uh, therefore I, I request now uh, Professor Nasima uh, to speak on science, uh, scientists uh, and society, do they have mutual obligations? So I think the buzzer will go off in about three to five minutes. Okay. Let me actually take this out here. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Perhaps before I start, I should tell you what the title I have for my talk is. It's called Science, Society, and the State. So, uh, yeah, and there was a misprint in the, the misprint in the official program. <laughs> and uh, really the question I want to address is uh, do they have mutual obligations? What should science expect from society and the state? What should the state expect from the scientists? What about society? And what do we expect from society? Now, this is not a very learned uh, social science, uh, natural science talk that I'm going to give, but really rather um, from what I've seen of the way that the system in India operates. Uh, tell you where I feel there are problems and what one might do, in what ways the Indian system is different from the other systems that I have been, uh, that I've had the chance to know. But first, before I get there, I want to congratulate the Academy, beginning with this president, Professor Ram Ramaswamy, and uh, the council and the fellows, for the initiative that they've taken in conceiving this new journal, an online journal, Dialogue, and for arranging this meeting, which uh, really sets the whole thing off on a, what I consider will be a um, historic, uh, historic event in the history of the Academy and, uh, and also in the way that we engage with these other forces in our nation as scientists. Well, a yeah, journal like this was badly needed, and Professor Ramaswamy already described why that was so. 
It's true, as he also pointed out, that the current science carries articles every now and then on matters related to policy, um, the problems connected, connected with Indian education, Indian science. So th there are these, but, but I think that uh, the time has come for a forum where more serious discussion and uh, what we hope will be a discussion that will eventually lead to a more coherent analysis and debate about what our problems are and what we might want to do with them. I see that the scope of this journal is very broad. It uh, concerns the practice of science, education, administration, policy, science policy, the science society interface, and related, many related issues. And I think that uh, this journal is badly needed. And to put it in, um, well, very frank terms, I don't think India is today doing as well in science, in global science, as we have the potential for doing and as we need to do. Our East Asian neighbors are ahead of us. I still remember a time when I first visited China saying, oh well, we are doing better than China. <laughs> but that was not long ago. In 1980, India was spending more on scientific research than China was. But if you look at where China is now, there's really no comparison. They are way ahead of us. And it's not only China. I'll come back to that in a moment. Our East Asian neighbors somehow are really doing, in, a, in an overall sense, better than we are doing. And the tragedy of that, in my view, is that actually I think, I believe, I am an optimist in these matters. I believe our country has a potential which we still have not realized at all. And that has really to do with the questions that are going to be raised in this uh, journal. It has to do with the relations between, as I see, science, society, and state. Well, are there mutual obligations? I believe there are. Uh, in other words, uh, we can't say that these are, uh, you know, single monolithic organizations which have nothing to do with each other. And um, in India, I think that these relations uh, have been discussed in a way. But I don't think they've yet led to solutions which gain wide acceptance and will give for the future of our country a position which I think is its due. Let me begin with the state. What is the state doing for science in India? Well, first of all, there are the major state agencies, government agencies, which usually deal with relatively well-defined areas of science. There's the Department of Atomic Energy, there's ISRO, there's the Defense Research and Development Organization, there is CSIR, there are the Agricultural Institutes, each one of these has a direct, the direct presence of the state in terms of actually running those organizations as well. These are very largely, in many cases entirely, run at the public expense. Except possibly for CSR, where there has always been pressure, and I think there is pressure now, to earn more of their money from industry, from outside, not just from the government. CSR does earn some money from the outside, but it's not a major part of what they earn. Uh, I do remember from my experience at NAL, I was lucky to be there at a time when NAL services were badly needed because of the light combat aircraft project. And we were nearly making 50% of the money from outside resources. And the CSIR review committee which came there asked me, why are you still in CSIR? If you make more than 50%, you can be an independent body, they said. I didn't know that, but I was not quite sure that we would be able to maintain that 50% for a long time. So, so anyway, but uh, there is great pressure now on CSIR, for example, to earn more of its resources from contacts with industry and so on. And once again, I come back to that point. Not particularly about CSIR, but about how 
that is important for the country as a whole. And I want to argue that even if you want to support only pure science, basic science, some of my friends in doing pure science, basic science, believe that uh, the money should be there and uh, no questions asked. I think it will be even in their interest if you have more money coming in from other sources. Higher education. If you look at the, <clears throat> the national institutes, the Indian institutes of various subjects in education and research, R&D, the IITs, the IIMs, this institute in a certain sense, JNC, the ICERs, the Indian Statistical Institute, the National Institutes of Technology, a very large number of them, where the basic funding really comes from the state. And that support is direct. But uh, many of the research programs in these institutes have often to be run based on contracts, um, projects, for which also the major source is usually the state. You may go to DST, for example, sponsored research, depending on your subject, you may get it from one of these agencies. Uh, DST has a National Science and Engineering Research Board, and there are some other bodies too which uh, support research. So between the, most of the sponsored research, as well as the basic budgets, are not being met by the government. In the engineering departments, there is some which comes from uh, industry, but still that's not a major component of how we do our research. As far as the universities are concerned, there are only a small number which have major scientific research programs. But uh, the private number of private universities is increasing. And uh, HRD and UGC provide basic support and support for certain kinds of projects. But even there, if you really wanted to do some hard research, you probably may have to go to DST or one of these other bodies. DBT is a major supporter of um, projects in biological sciences. But the outcome from the state agencies is technology, products, systems, and the degree of success, I think, varies. But uh, their uh, charters and missions are well defined. This row is an example of what you can do. And I think there is a widespread agreement in the country among all sections of opinion that somehow it's doing better than others. I say that not because I'm an aerospace scientist, but I say that to show that it's actually possible to do it. And we should really ask ourselves, why is it that some agencies do better than others? And what are the examples, what are the um, lessons that we can take from how some of these have succeeded, although that success is not uniform. As far as the educational institutions are concerned, I think their assessment is largely based, I think, uh, uh, for some time now, on um, a small number of metrics. The major one here, it seems to me, is the number of papers that the scientists write, the citations they get. In other words, it is publication oriented. Of course, this whole business of assessing papers and uh, giving you information on citations and so on is now a minor global industry. And a variety of different criteria may be used in those rankings. However, I think that while that is important, scientists of course have to write their papers, otherwise there's no way of communicating the results of their work with others and examining others' uh, work also. I do think that there are other criteria which ought to receive uh, more attention than they have. And this is uh, success in translational research, in innovation, these, although they are encouraged in public, in actual fact, don't count quite for as much as I think the publications do. 
And I think that um, there is a problem here, particularly in those areas connected with uh, engineering and technology. But I think that uh, it is bigger than that. It is bigger than that in the sense that we have to ask ourselves, what are our, what are our relations, what are our obligations towards science and society, to, towards state and society, in terms of doing not only research and publishing papers, but in terms of doing all these other things, which go to boost the economy, and in particular also will increase the amount of funds that are going to be available for even basic research. I'll come back to that point later on again. Of course, as far as basic research is concerned, I know many scientist friends from uh, basic research who really would like in their, in their uh, in their uh, picture, image, of what a good system is. Somebody will come and say, I like the research you're doing. There is so much money, and just do what you like. And that, of course, <laughs> would be very good if that can happen. But it doesn't always happen. <clears throat> well, the government does give support research. And um, although you may think that I, being, a, being professionally, having started out as an engineer, I might have a bias, and I, I want to tell you that I have a bias of an engineer. But also the bias is not that of uh, any engineer in, uh, in a professional sense. Uh, it so happens that the subject I do can be seen both as science and uh, as engineering, fluid dynamics, I'm talking about fluid dynamics, because of its wide applications and the fact that fundamental problems in fluid dynamics remain unsolved to this day as science. Uh, many of you will have heard of what has been said about the problem of turbulence. Fluid dynamics, the equations are known. They were formulated nearly 200 years ago. There will be an anniversary before long. But to this day, the problem of turbulence has defied solution. You may not believe it. If you say, tell me as a problem in physics, what the pressure loss in the spike is going to be when there is turbulent flow through it, you won't be able to tell. Everybody knows what the value is. The engineers buy variety of tests and some tricks have predicted them with considerable confidence. But as a problem in physics, it's unsolved. Feynman said turbulence is the last unsolved problem of classical physics. So I think I can claim to have uh, a foot in both, both uh, domains. Now, I think, uh, of course, although these are no longer said with the same, um, um, what do you call it, with the same uh, <laughs> um, strength as it was. You'll remember what Hardy said about his work. Thank God this, this is mostly useless. Okay? In other words, it was not really meant to be applied. And Dirac once said, well, you know, I would much rather have beauty in my equations than that they agree with experiments. And so, so these are, the, these are views which I'm not incidentally criticizing. I, what I want to say is that those are, those are views which have to be uh, assessed and those are views which have to be heard. And um, I believe that one of the greatest obligations that the state has towards science is to make sure that that kind of science, even if it's considered useless, is supported. Now, the re one reason for saying that is that what is considered useless today will turn out not to be so later on. 20 years later, 50 years later, it may, it may turn out to be uh, extraordinary. It may, it may lead to revolutions, even in technology. And this has happened again and again. I don't think Einstein thought it would lead to a big nuclear industry or to nuclear wars. I don't think uh, uh, many of the people who founded quantum mechanics would have foreseen the extraordinary developments that have taken place in commu energy, communication, computing, totally unheard of. And uh, there was a famous presidential commission in the late 1930s in the United States. The president asked them to predict what might happen in the next 10 years, 10 years later. This was the late 1930s. 
They could not foresee what happened in nuclear energy. They could not foresee what happened in computing. They could not foresee the transistor. So the 10 years later when you compared it, it was nowhere, the prediction was nowhere. So first of all, I do think it's very important to support basic science, uh, irrespective of what their own people might say about their obligations to society. There are other people who will make sure that that knowledge can be exploited. Now, I think as far as institutions are concerned, however, I think that attitude for, a, for a, an institution with a large number of disciplines, that attitude is not the best. I think that the institution has an obligation, which an individual might not have. I think an institution's obligation has to be that it has a role to play in helping solve the many pressing problems that we face in this country and also in the world. Many of them have already been uh, listed. Medical care, health, agriculture, water resources, climate change, jobs, poverty, and so on. This obligation is not direct because we can't, in an institution like this, for example, solve all those problems, but they must always be kept in mind. Um, one way of assessing what's the state's appreciation of uh, the world of uh, science and scientists is, is by finding out how much they will need to spend on it. Now in India, there's a remarkable fact. Surprising, but it is true. For more than 20 years now, the percentage of GDP, gross domestic, gross domestic product, that the government of India spends on R&D has not varied. It's been 0.8%. 0.7% sometimes, 0.8%, 0.85%. Never reached to one. For the hasn't fallen below 07 either. It is extraordinary. It's extraordinary because what's happened in the rest of the world is very different. Let me give you just some examples. Let me start with some of our Asian neighbors. You know the country which spends the largest fraction of its GDP on, uh, on research, on science, science and the R&D and so on? It is South Korea, 4.3%. It is matched only by Israel, 4.3%. Japan is 3.6%. Taiwan is 3%. China is 2.2%. Well, I happened to visit Korea when this was beginning to happen. And it was, uh, it, it was an exciting place. Uh, there were so many initiatives being taken. Uh, China was spending less than us in the 1980s. But we have remained static, whereas these other countries have gone ahead. Europe is around 2 plus percent. The US is 2.7 percent. But at 2.7 percent, their, uh, their wealth is so high, the GDP is so high, that really it nearly accounts for about half of the money being spent in the world on R&D. So that's, that's the position. Now why is it that the government of India has never thought fit to raise this from 0.8 percent? Well, I think and this is, this is independent of the party in power. Independent of the party in power. Whether it's a coalition, or whether it's rightist or leftist or whatever, this figure has not changed. There must be a widespread perception in the government that uh, there won't be many high, very high returns, much higher returns on this money spent than what they're now getting. But uh, this is slightly misleading. Because if you look at the number of countries where the government invests more than 1% of GDP in their R&D, it's a very small number, it's only 4. The people are spending 4%, and the government is not spending 4%. The 3% is coming from industry. It's, it's industry-sponsored research that has actually led to such high expenditures of the government. So first thing, main point I want to make, is that it's important to consider industry as well as a major force. And I think if in America you get a lot of support for doing science and engineering, it's partly because of the large contributions that come from industry itself. 
not in India. And I think the other reason is that uh, India is not a big source of export. Our exports are low, the falling. And uh, I personally don't think, although I would not argue that uh, point uh, very strongly here, that without, without uh, actually having a vigorous export program, uh, the chances that there will be much more money, even for beautiful pure science, are dense. Now, export, uh, many people may not know it. It so happens that in colo colonial India was exporting more than independent India is doing in terms of money. Until about 1800, a little more than 200 years ago, 1870-50 let's say, India actually was exporting quite a lot. Uh, India and China were major exporting countries. And there was nothing really that they wanted to import from Europe. In fact, in those days, if you wanted to sell something to India, uh, the Indian merchants would say, well, you know, you have to bring silver. I don't care about your coinage. I don't care your, about your currency. I'm saying this only to indicate that exporting is not something new which we have to learn from Europe. Is, uh, in our own tradition and history, there's a large, long record when India was exporting. Maybe spices, it may be iron and steel, but there were many things which were exported from this country. Well, about um, general, uh, the general stand that one might take or in a, an educational institution, higher, higher, higher education, in higher education, um, where these things should be taken into account. I think that one struck me as uh, important to keep in mind. This is what Princeton does. Well, Princeton has a motto which says, in the service of the nation. For a long time, its motto was, in the service of the nation. But in recent times, we have made an amendment to it. In the service of the nation and in the service of other nations. You must take a global view, they said. Not only, not only about the United States of America. And the priorities in their objectives are quite clearly stated. First and foremost, provide the nation with the next generation of leaders. In everything. In science. In basic science, in applied science, even the humanities and the social sciences, everything. We want to provide the next generation of leaders for our country. And they explicitly stated three, three activities, three, um, um, three um, parts of their, uh, of their program as the ones that determine the kind of faculty that they will have. Believe it or not, teaching is number one. Of course, they have enlarged undergraduate body education very seriously. Teaching, research, and the third thing is called scholarly citizenship. Well, a person who is a scholarly citizen or a citizen scholar, maybe a scientist, as I said, natural scientist, social scientist, it doesn't matter, requires, has to be, you have to, you have to recognize it. In other words, the metrics are a little more spread out than I think what they are in a large number of Indian institutions. Now, it's something which I think started at Princeton, and what I gather from my American friends is that these concepts are beginning to spread. A private university, in particular, has to give primacy to teaching, because otherwise they won't get their students, and the uh, expenses, costs of education are going up, Students usually have to educate themselves on loans, which they return later on. So that some economists are saying a degree may no longer be economically worthwhile because of the investment you make in yourself. So I think that these are actually uh, very important things to remember. Where am I?
Well, what are the obligations of science to society? I've touched on the obligations of the state to science. Basic science in particular, I think, demands it. And on the obligations of the state to have the right kind of economic and industrial policies that industry will want to serve, support a lot of this work, which is more or less the only way that most countries have, are spending so much money on R&D. And I think that all of these should be discussed. So I would say that among the subjects that, that uh, the that dialogue to discuss, this connection with industry must be kept in mind. I think it's very important. As far as science and society are concerned, we've already talked about the wars of Bangalore, sorry, the, the many problems at the national and local level. And here in Bangalore, we are all very familiar with the wars of the city. Newspapers are full of them. Four killed in potholes, they say. Our lakes are all being polluted. More, many of them have dried up. I myself happen to live in a place which was a lake bed once upon a time. <laughs> and uh, traffic is terrible. Garbage is a huge mess. Fortunately, I think civic interest in Bangalore is growing. As a native of Bangalore, I am really dismayed and saddened by the way that the city has lost its job. It's no longer the Bangalore it used to be. I'm not saying that Bangalore should have remained a small town, but I think it's expanded without any planning and has grown huge now, huge population. And uh, the things that it used to be known for you know, are no, no longer so easily available. So new solutions and new technologies are necessary for tackling these problems. New methods of administration are badly needed, I think. I think that uh, these are in some sense also part of what science might, must do for society. I don't mean Bangalore only, but I think there are many cities that have these problems. And I think there are uh, cultural sides to the obligations of science to society. In particular, I think scientists who are working at the expense of the state or even of industry must be able to explain to society why they are doing and what they are doing. It might even be for just for the excitement, the intellectual excitement that they have when they do something new, something very different although they may not foresee an application for it at that time. Even that excitement must also must be shared. People must know that actually somebody is excited about some work that he has done and why he is excited. We must engage with society. Well, I think that um, this is not something which formally happens in an educational institution very often. Some individuals, of course, do it. But by and large, I think it would be uh, very useful if uh, uh, if these education institutions, major education institutions have a more serious dialogue with society. Um, well, I was associated with the National Institute of Advanced Studies for seven years or so. And one reason that the National Institute, that National Institute was set up was actually this, that you needed a forum where you could talk to other sectors of society and nation, government, society, and so on. It was, a, it was the dream of J.R.D. Tata, and J.R.D. Tata wanted all knowledge, all knowledge. No, no, no branch of knowledge is excluded here. That was, that's actually even its operating principle even today. This does not mean that Every branch of knowledge is represented there or being pursued. No. But they will never say this is outside our scope. It is something that can help the country and work for it. And uh, I think, however, that it's good that uh, if, uh, <clears throat> if educational institutions also did a little bit more of that and expanded 
their range of contacts with the various sectors of society and government and industry. One other uh, area is what's called the scientific temple. That was Jawaharlal Nehru's words. And he thought it was very important that everybody in the country must have scientific temple. And um, a great deal has been said about it. And you continuously see, continually see debates about rationalists and uh, the attacks that have taken place on them. Uh, whoever did it, we may not know, but... And um, there's been much argument about uh, what rationalism is. I remember long ago, the meeting which was convened at Uti. I don't know whether there's anybody else here who was at that meeting. Uh, it was uh, led by uh, the late Dr. Pushpa Bhagwa. It was really about scientific temper and about rationalism. Uh, we met in Kunur actually, not Uti really, uh, more precisely Kunur. And uh, we had a day's discussion. Many different views were expressed. And eventually a statement was made. There was an issue of seminar devoted to scientific temper in uh, India. Was there anybody here at that meeting? Probably not. Okay, so let me say what, uh, what happened after that. Well, that statement was, uh, that statement and uh, various uh, essays about that statement and about the subject appeared in an issue of seminar. I was also one of the people who were present there. But in the next issue, there appeared a letter from a Cambridge philosopher, Professor Iyer, well known, very well known for his work. And his response was actually enlightening and revealing to me and had a profound effect on me. And he said, well, it's, it's very important, it's very interesting that scientists have gathered to argue for the scientific temperament. And I do think that's important. But what struck me, he said, was that they appeal almost exclusively to Western philosophical sources. He said, if you go back and look at the literature in, on, on philosophy in India or on science, you will find that there is, a, there is a very strong, what you might call scientific temper, a very strong rationalistic streak in most of those works. Now, since then, I spent a fair bit of my time trying to look at our own ancient scientific works. And uh, it's sort of become a hobby for me. I find it very relaxing to look at what those old people are saying. And there are some conclusions which one comes to very fast. Anyway, I came to very fast. In the first place, they were very smart. Uh, they, they, yukti was their, was their word and uh, for, for how you should tackle these matters. There's no doubt that they were smart. Arya but I had a table of science in four lines of Sanskrit words. And uh, there are all kinds of things which, uh, which really are very attractive. But much more than that, the works on science itself rarely mention God. And they're rationalistic, not in the sense in which uh, we understand today, but in the sense of which, which and in the, uh, but in the sense which I think basically characterizes science. Namely, um, your conclusions are based on evidence, number first, perception, experiment, first one. Okay, I finished a few minutes. Based on evidence, based on reasoning. Reasoning meant for the Indians, ancient Indians, inference. Not logic like the Greeks. Exactly what the what form the reasoning had to take place depended varied with culture, but it had to do with it had to do in India with inference and um, what was called yukti. Yukti was really the use of human intelligence to interpret the facts that you have, the patterns in, in those facts. Minus authority. It did not. It should not rely on authority, and in particular. The Agamas, the Vedas, they've said, more than one has said, uh, even if this contradicts the Agamas or the scriptures, 
This is really the truth. Now, the people who said that, Aryabhata said something very similar. And uh, Nilakanta said it very explicitly. Etat Sarvam Yukti Mulam, he said. Not to Agama Mulam. Aryabhata said, this is all come out of my intelligence. Maybe that is the gift of God. That is, I who have worked hard at this ocean of knowledge and ignorance to give you these gems of astronomical knowledge. And so, there is in fact a strong streak of uh, rationalism in Indian science. Now, at the same time, there was no big fight about rationalism. Although the Pauranics and uh, the uh, Siddhantics, as they were called, did have arguments. It never reached the proportions that it reached in uh, Europe, where uh, quite often this might have been punished. The argument was there, but uh, uh, there, there were clearly, the lines were clearly drawn. But it was tolerated. Both sides said, okay, there may be some other use to it. And so I kept it going. I wrote a little bit about it in an editorial in Current Science some time ago. Finally, what is the obligation of society to science? Well, I think the major thing would be if, if science does all these things for society and state, if they feel that something is coming out of science and if they feel more and more attracted towards science, both as a profession and as an element of culture and civilization, and if they acquire a more scientific and rational view, I think that if you were arguing with them, saying this rational view is not something imported only from some other part of the world, but here were your ancestors who said these things, I think it will be more easily accepted. And I think that uh, that is that kind of appreciation and that kind of a change of overall view uh, would be more than what we, may have, what we have a right to expect as an obligation from society to us. Thank you very much. So we'll uh, take just one or two uh, questions now. I forgot to uh, mention earlier um, that the lectures and the discussions are uh, both being recorded and are actually being uh, video streamed. Uh, so um, please speak into the mic. Don't ask uh, any questions without the mic's benefit. Yeah, you had a question. Good afternoon to one and all. So when the 2017 list of Indian uh, top three space uh, organizations were listed by Forbes, Indian space organization occupied third place. But when we consider the last one year progress of Indian space research organization compared to uh, the top two leading, that is uh, NASA and JAXA, the overall percentage of the growth as well as the loss percentage if we consider the launch of the satellites and GSLV Mark III that was being done. And we were successful. When compared to the loss, the loss of the HRSS satellite that was in the fourth stage, which, on, uh, which was launched on August 30th, the, uh, that we uh, failed in fourth stage. And the uh, other two losses that I noticed was Yashpal sir and UR Rao sir passed away. So when compared, the percentage of success that we had were highest. Can we consider these two, uh, can we consider overall these as the uh, glimpse of Indian space organization slowly but surely occupying the first position in the world as a uh, higher space research organization? <laughs> okay. I don't know what you mean by the first position in the world. I'll tell you why. In terms of not in the first, not even the second. I mean, the United States, Europe, and China are much bigger than we are. 
However, the Indian uh, space program is unique. Why is it unique? Right from the beginning, in fact, I should have said this during my talk. <laughs> I'm glad you asked this question. Right from the beginning, the pioneers who set up the program, chiefly Dr. Sarabhai and Dr. Dhaba, first two chiefs of the program, emphasized that space should be used for societal purposes. It is state for society. They explicitly said, we should not do this for prestige. And explicitly they said, we do not want to have anything to do with defense or missiles. Professor Dhawan actually, when he was invited for the position, made this a condition. So, there has been no other program in the world which has taken societal objectives as its first priority. From that point of view, it's unique. Now, for a long time, um, as the space program was going, not many people paid too much attention to it. But that is now attracting many people to the philosophy that ISRO has followed. If you Google and look up in, on the net, you find an American analyst who has an article which says, why NASA should take tutorials from ISRO? <laughs> and his argument is the following. He says, NASA is confused. They don't know exactly what they should do. Whereas ISRO has never been confused. Their objectives have been clear. And they've done it at a cost which is, which is the lowest in the world. Today, if uh, space were to industrialize in India, we would be exporters. And I think we should do it. But not because we have the biggest rockets in the world, we don't. Not because we, because we have the biggest program in the world, we don't. I think that's the way it should be. We should do what we consider important and do it well. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'm afraid.